Good evening. Good evening. On behalf of the Crossroads Cultural Center Houston and the University of Houston, we welcome you to tonight's event, Natural Gas Human Capital at Work. Crossroads Cultural Center is a nonprofit organization that was born in New York over five years ago. Crossroads Houston was founded over a year ago by a group of friends who share a passion for cultural work. For us, culture is not just an intellectual or academic exercise, but it includes every aspect of the human effort to know and make sense of reality. It is the presumption of old age that reality is shaped by our ideas. Actually, life is either the continuous, exciting discovery of something that was unknown, or it is an inev inevitable slide into boredom. This face-to-face -face series is about men and women whose life and work we find striking and fascinating. So much so that we would like to ask them to share with us their experience. A fascinating person is certainly a good way to describe our guest, Mr. Harold Carell. Under Harold Carell's leadership, Southwestern Energy found one of the biggest natural gas fields in the nation. In his vision, the development of human capital starts with cultivating the innate curiosity in people that leads to innovation, creativity, and hard work. It is evident from his story that the human factor plays a fundamental role in the economic sphere. Unfortunately, there is a tendency in our culture to think of economy as a fairly impersonal process that can be understood in scientific terms or by numbers alone. In our opinion, economic processes cannot be understood in separation from the reality of the people who work and produce. Ultimately, all economic systems reflect the desires, talents, and skills of the peoples who participate in them. For this reason, we invited our guest speaker to share his views on human capital in the natural gas industry tonight. Let me turn the program over to our friend Serena Miggins, who will introduce our speakers. I would like to first introduce Dr. Tyler Priest, our host from the University of Houston. Dr. Priest is clinical professor and the director of global studies at C.T. Bauer College of Business. He's a specialist in the history of energy, business, and globalization, and is a leading expert in the history of the offshore oil and gas industry. Of recent note, two years ago, Dr. Priest won the Geosciences in the Media Award from the Association of American Petroleum Geologists for his book, The Offshore Imperative, Shell Oil's Search for Petroleum in Post-War America. Next, I would like to introduce our face-to-face -face guest speaker, and afterward, Dr. Priest will introduce him in more detail in the context of the natural gas industry. Mr. Harold Carell is the executive chairman of the board of Southwestern Energy, one of the fastest growing U.S. oil and gas companies in a $10 billion enterprise. In 2005, Southwestern Energy was ranked 49th on the Forbes list of 200 best small companies. Four years later, in 2009, the company was included on the Forbes list of 400 best big companies. Prior to these accomplishments, Mr. Carell had worked for 17 years in various technical and managerial positions at Tenneco. <coughs> Mr. Carell is a graduate of the Colorado School of Mines with a professional degree in chemical and petroleum refining engineering. Now I would like to turn it over to Dr. Priest. Interactive graphic where you can sort a 
uh, list of 35 oil and gas executives, uh, chief executives, uh, in various ways by their total compensation for the year 2008, but the most interesting way is by best value, uh, which is measured by executive compensation against one year shareholder return and total return on uh, capital employed. And when you sort the list by the best value, the name that rises to the top is Harold Correll. Um, looking at the uh, Financial Times graphic, one might be tempted to conclude that Mr. Correll was grossly under rewarded for his services uh, in Southwestern Energy compared to some of his peers. Uh, but he's quick to point out that this is not the case. Uh, due mainly to his holdings in Southwestern Energy stock. Um, and during the last decade, uh, Southwestern Energy stock performed better than most, uh, just about any other company that you can think of. Um, for most of this period, Southwestern Energy led the entire oil and gas industry in total shareholder return. Between 2000 and 2008, South Energy, Southwestern Energy was the best performing stock in the S&P 500 from 2000 to 2008, uh, with an average annual return of 48%. Uh, number two was Gilead Sciences at 38%. Gilead is the producer of uh, HIV AIDS medication. And number three, Apple Computer at 31%. So what, what is the story behind a company whose shares far outperform Apple Computer during a period that may go down in history as the i-decade after the iPod and the iPhone. Uh, the story itself may turn out to be of equal importance to the iPhone. Uh, and this is the discovery of how to extract natural gas from the hard, sh hard shale beds of Colorado and Texas and Arkansas and Pennsylvania. Uh, and this is, a, this is a development that has transformed the energy landscape of the United States and could possibly transform the energy landscape of the world. Ten years ago, uh, the oil and gas industry uh, was concerned about the supply of domestic natural gas in this country. There were plans to uh, develop and permit uh, liquefied natural gas facilities to take natural gas from around the world. Now most of those plans are shelved or postponed uh, as companies such as Southwestern Energy have applied new methods of horizontal drilling, hydraulic fracturing, uh, to access natural gas embedded in the shale formations. And this has suddenly given the United States, uh, by some estimates, a 100-year supply of natural gas. Okay. Uh, holding out the possibility that natural gas uh, will replace coal as the nation's primary source of electricity and possibly replace crude oil as the main source of fuel uh, for our nation's vehicles. Under, under Harold Curl's leadership, Southwestern Energy was one of the first companies to enter the sector of the industry. In 2002, the company first recognized the gas potential of the Arkansas Fayetteville Shale and subsequently secured the rights to drill across this region uh, before any other company picked up on the idea. But as Mr. Correll will detail for us tonight, I think, the pathway to success at Southwestern began before any wells were ever drilled in the Fayetteville Shale. It had to do with people and ideas as much as with natural gas, just as human inspiration and innovation have enabled Apple Computer to revolutionize digital computing. Uh, they also have revolutionized the energy business. The development of human capital presupposed the development of natural capital. Our new national treasure, really, in natural gas is the result of human capital at work. Uh, the legendary Can I say something before you start Wall asking Travis me questions? One said, okay. whatever the geological conditions may be whatever techniques we employ, we find oil in the earth very rarely unless we have first acquired an appropriate mental attitude. Gold is where you find it, according to an old adage, but judging from the record of our experience, oil must be sought first of all in our minds. So we have a pleasure tonight 
of hearing from Mr. Correll uh, how he and his people at Southwestern Energy first found shale gas in their mines. I introduce Mr. Correll. Are these things, are these mics working right? Okay, good. I didn't know by the time I patched them on there whether they would be or not. Are you taking all those notes with you? What am I going to talk about? <laughs> uh, actually, I, I'm not sure the format here, except I, I think we're going to have sort of some questions and then... Uh, uh, but I, 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 did, I did ask if I could say a couple things. Uh, I appreciate that nice introduction. Uh, but probably the most fun moment for me uh, amongst those accolades that uh, Southwestern Energy has received uh, is the one that uh, you kind of almost got there and you didn't quite get there, but during the 10-year period while George Bush was president, uh, and this was an analysis of uh, one of the Wall Street uh, analysts, the uh, total shareholder return that Southwestern Energy generated during those, uh, the 10 years of the, the decade of the, uh, uh, the last 10 years uh, was the number one performing company of all the Standard & Poor's 500. Uh, the number two company was Apple Computer. And the reason I wanted to share that with you is I'm an Apple guy. <laughs> I have never learned, uh, you guys, most of you don't probably know what MS-DOS even is, but I managed to live through having a 128K Mac. That was my beginning Apple. Uh, learning to use a spreadsheet on a program called Multiplan. And I managed to survive in the corporate world since 1982, never owning an IBM PC. Uh, and, and that is, uh, for me, when this article came out about Southwestern being the number one performing stock and shareholder return for 10 years, and the number two company was Apple, I felt so good uh, <laughs> because I love Apple products. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know that it has, our success has anything to do with that, but I do think there are parallels in terms of innovation uh, in Southwestern Energy and Apple Computer. And one of my great desires, I haven't gotten the guts to do this yet, but I've been wanting to call Stephen Jobs and say, hi, I'm a CEO and I'm an Apple. The problem is, I think I look more like a PC, but I think that I would like to be on one of his ads and say, and I've always been an Apple, you know. Uh, I've never been a PC. I just had to share that because it's, it's, and I still may call him. I don't know if he'd return my call. So. Okay, I'm going to ask you some questions. Why did you become an entrepreneur? And what was the driving force in your first discoveries? How were you able to risk following your intuition? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I, <laughs> how, why, how did I become an entrepreneur? I, I think I became an entrepreneur because I grew up the son of a second generation American who was a truck driver in Wyoming. And, um, you know, from that experience, seeing my father get up at 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning, go get in an 18-wheeler and drive through Wyoming winters, encouraged me to not want to do that. It encouraged me to want to figure out how I was going to make a different kind of living than he had. And I could see that education, uh, because I wasn't the largest guy in town, and the people who got summer jobs bucking bales in the alfalfa fields and uh, hammering uh, spikes into railroad ties for the railroad were the biggest guys. You know, they all got jobs, and I couldn't get one of those because, you know, they wanted the big guys, even though I could work hard. So you know, my, uh, my view was to get a good education and then figure out how do, you, uh, how do you make a go in life, basically, I guess. And so, you know, entrepreneurship probably grew out of that for me. I don't know where the drive comes from. I, d I don't know what it is, uh, but I could always see that Sort of like I, I noticed squirrels in Wyoming gathered nuts all near in the fall and summer because if you didn't, you'd freeze to death. You wouldn't be able to eat. Up there, you can't live through the winter without some stores. So, you know, my vision was get an education. That was my best opportunity. It would open up things. And so I went from there. Now, I think the question about how did we have our first discoveries um, you know, I, 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 the question I think she wants me to talk about is within Southwestern Energy, really, how did we 
uh, hit the big home run, the uh, discovery of the Fayetteville Shale in Arkansas. And I can tell you that story, and I, and I will, and I'll share you some thoughts uh, along the way, maybe about how some of this comes together. But the primary driver of what we've done as a company has been innovation. And, uh, and I want to talk about that concept of innovation within the context of finding the Fayetteville Shale. Um, so um, one of the great writers of business and so on that I've appreciated over the years is, and some of you may have read some of his articles, is a gentleman by the name of Peter Drucker, who died about three or four years ago. Uh, he was an immigrant from Austria, uh, lived through you know, a lot of the bad times there, came to the US, and uh, he wrote an article about innovation, I don't know when it was, 25 or 30 years ago. And as a young manager with Tinoco Oil Company out in California, uh, was sitting at a meeting one day and the president of Tinoco had come through town and he stood up there over a podium like this and he said to all of us at this evening occasion that we're working for the company, he said, he said, now, men, we've got to have innovation in this company. You have to work innovatively. And he was a big lurching guy, so he, you know, on the front row, you kind of feel him because he was coming right over the top. And uh, I was sitting there, you know, I was a young manager. It was the first time I had, it's like profit and loss responsibility for a division of the company. And I thought, uh, you know, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure you're right about that. Because we have to find new oil and gas and we have to do all these things. But, but what does he mean, you know, by, by innovation and by working innovatively? Because he didn't describe it. He just kept saying, well, you've got to have, in, you've got to be innovative. And, uh, and I started to think, well, how could I get a group of people who worked for me there, uh, geologists and engineers of various kinds, how could I get them to be innovative if I didn't even understand what innovation was? And so I started looking for uh, some information about innovation. That's when I found the Peter Drucker article on innovation. And uh, we didn't have the internet then, of course. Uh, what was his name? Hadn't invented it yet, uh, the vice president. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I was faced with rummaging around and I found this article and Peter Drucker said that basically, remember these four things because I'm going to come back to them in the context of southwestern energy and in the context of the Fayetteville Shale and finding that. Uh, he said that innovation occurs kind of in four ways. Uh, one way uh, he described as process driven innovation. And this you can understand, it's probably the most understood concept of innovation. It means things like you have to find a better way to do this because the way you're doing it now is not working or it is not profitable, so therefore you can't make a business out of it, right? So you, uh, it might be for engineers, it might be you have to develop a better pump, you know, to pump this stuff from here to there because what we have now just doesn't do it. So engineers go and they use their science and engineering backgrounds and they go through, you know, grunt their way, I call it grunt your way uh, through the solution. It's process driven innovation. Uh, and that's most understood. Um, he said the, the second form of where innovation can take place is in incong when incongruities exist. Kind of a big word, incongruities. And um, what he really means by that in simple terms is where whatever your analysis is and all says uh, this should, A should happen, but in fact, B or C happens. And so therefore there's, there's something that's incongruent. It's not fitting. Now, um, curious people will follow up on that. Non-curious people will just say, oh, that's the way it is, go on. So uh, incongruities is the uh, second uh, area for innovation. And the third area he described was unexpected occurrences. It's a little bit like incongruities, but not quite. Uh, the, I, remembering back, I think the example that he used to describe unexpected occurrences was uh, the researcher or doctor or pharmacist or whatever he was who back in whatever year invented Novocaine. And he invented Novocaine. His purpose for inventing Novocaine was he was in, involved in trying to figure out how to make uh, 
amputation is a little more comfortable for the patient. And uh, rather than put a stick in his mouth and give him a swig of whiskey, if you could shoot him up with Novocaine, you could cut the hand off or whatever it was, gory subject, right? And, and, uh, and he could, you could do it without pain. Now, what happened uh, after this great invention of Novocaine is, as you know today, it became used, uh, popular use became using it to numb your gums to do fillings. And probably now young people don't even have fillings anymore, but I have a lot of them. But they use it to numb your gum uh, such that you don't feel them drilling in there. And uh, uh, now what happened is this fellow who had invented Novocaine spent, rather than recognizing that it was, you know, a good use was for dental work, uh, he spent the rest of his career lecturing about the misuse of Novocaine for dental work. So very much an unexpected occurrence. He, he had in his head so strongly that he developed it for one thing and it became useful for something else for obvious reasons. You know, when you're going to get your hand cut off, you just soon be totally asleep, right? So um, unexpected occurrences. There's opportunity there when some of those happen. And there's a time for innovation. Uh, the fourth area that Drucker described for, about innovation was uh, he called it demographic changes. And I've chosen, you know, I, I talk about these four things within Southwestern Energy a lot. And I've been talking about them within Southwestern Energy for the last 12 or 13 years to make, to try to get my, our people to think in terms of these kinds of activities. Uh, I call it, instead of demographic changes, I call it paradigm shifts. And, uh, you know, where, where, where he would say, in a marketing sort of situation, here comes the baby boomers along. So then they're, you know, as that wave moves along, uh, understand that there are a lot of business opportunities right in front of that. Um, and I'll describe in just a minute why I would rather call it paradigm shifts because it applies into our findings in our business, and particularly the Fayetteville Shale. So take all that into what we have done. I think it's important for you to get a, an academic concept of that. And, uh, and I think if you carry that around in your life, you will tend to recognize areas in which there is some discovery to be made. Uh, the Fayetteville Shale in Arkansas, you know, when you look at the company today, anybody that looks at us, they say, well, you guys are blessed because you've got the Fayetteville Shale. We did not have the Fayetteville Shale. We had people who were working on a completely different idea than the Fayetteville Shale. Back in uh, 2002, we had a geologist who was working to try to determine whether we could drill additional wells and complete them. Uh, I don't know how much you know about our business, but we drill holes in the ground, we case those holes, then we shoot, uh, we, you know, we drill the borehole, then we run casing in it, cement it, and then we shoot holes to perforate uh, next to the, the strata that we would think would have oil or gas in it, and then that comes into the well. So we've sealed the well off from groundwater, from drinkable waters, all that, because you, you have to isolate from that, or you'd get a lot of water in your well, which wouldn't you know, work. And uh, So our guys were, one geologist was doing maps of a sandstone called the Weddington Sandstone. Now in the oil and gas business, almost all oil and gas over millennium has been produced from rocks we call sandstones which are like beach sand that's compressed and consolidated into rock, or from carbonates, which uh, would be like reefal material, uh, like in the Bahamas where you have carbonate reefs. And, uh, and uh, we really, as an industry, had not recognized that you might be able to produce gas from shale rocks, which are much more, much harder, less permeable uh, rocks. And so this guy was mapping. We had drilled, our company 20 years ago had drilled some wells and they had uh, penetrated through this sandstone. And so we were trying to determine whether we could drill more and encounter that sandstone uh, in, within the area that he was studying. And so the work that he did is he made a map so you can know what area it's in. It's kind of like playing Battleship. You hit one here or you didn't and you hit one there. So you know it's either there or not there. Well, is it in between? Maybe, but you don't know. But you can, uh, knowing the thickness of the sandstone and the area, uh, right, so you've got area times uh, height is volume, 
and then knowing the porosity of it, how much pore space is there, you can calculate how much gas there should be in that sandstone and with a reasonable assumption for how much percentage recovery you should have, you can calculate how much you should have produced out of those wells. And so therefore, uh, he did the work and it said, we should have produced X amount of gas out of those 10 or 15 wells. Well, the truth of the matter was, when you looked over history, those wells had produced four to eight times X. So we produced a lot more gas, and the question was, why? Now, what I just described was an incongruity, right? Uh, the data says this, yet reality says that. A lot of people might have just walked away. And they, but they didn't walk away. This individual pointed it out to another person, a reservoir engineer. This was a geologist. He pointed this out to a reservoir engineer. Those are the guys that really do the rock work, you know, and really get in the guts of it and know science of it. And, you know, they went through an analysis, and sure enough, there's an incongruity here. So where is this gas? Where did this gas come from? Well, it just so happens that this Weddington sandstone, if you think as the earth as layers, and you're way down here at 6,000 feet, right above and right below, contiguous with, the sandstone is shale rock, Fayetteville shale rock. And so the completions that we were doing over the years were getting gas con being contributed, we thought then, from the shale rock. So this is the uh, genesis of the idea of the discovery of the Fayetteville shale. Um, we might have stopped there, however, because the thickness of the shale rock there was only about 50 or 70 feet thick. Now the only other place in the world that people had produced gas from shale rock at that time was in the Barnett Shale in North Texas near Fort Worth. And there the shale was at least 300 feet thick. So what we had was 50 or 70.